Hey, Chris, how you doing? I'm good. How you doing, Pete? Good, good. I appreciate you joining us today. Uh, you uh, stayed safe up in Ottawa? Absolutely. I yeah, hunkered down, staying safe. But uh, no, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Good, good. Well, um, you know, we've been chatting a bit around uh, industry trends. And, uh, you know, today's our first live interview here on the, the Team Future Tech podcast. Uh, you know, Pete Cappiello here, CEO of Future Tech. Uh, excited about creating, you know, hopefully some valuable content for our clients. But, uh, you know, before we get into the, the, the microwave trends, uh, do you mind giving a little bit of uh, background on yourself? Uh, sure. For yeah. So, you bet. Yeah. Chris York, um, VP of sales with Future Tech. Um, prior to being here, you know, been in the industry for a little while. So I was at North North for eight years, uh, then Dragon Wave for just under nine years, where I, you know, really got quite a bit of exposure to the microwave space, you can imagine. Um, so that's uh, really one of my, my core areas of focus. Uh, and then with Future Tech for for over two years now. Yeah, lot, lot, you know, since you've you've moved from being on the uh, the OEM side, I mean, you've you've been exposed to quite a bit of different types of technologies. Is that? Fair yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, from you know licensed to uh, you know un unlicensed EBAN type systems, uh, you know, on the micro side, and then prior to that. Um, at Nortel, I mean, it was a full full range of things in the chief technology office there. So uh, touched on quite a bit. Bit fortunate that way. Cool, cool. Well, today let's let's focus on uh, you know let's focus on the technology, the trends. Uh, I'm going to pull up your uh, your presentation here. Sure. I appreciate you putting together some slides. So uh, let me let me put that on. <laughs> so we're uh, we can see your slides now. Perfect. Perfect. And so I'll walk through. I mean, the intent here is, is not not a plug by any means. This is intended to be educational. It's not, uh, you know, it's not specific to any one vendor or technology. It's somewhat agnostic and hoping to spur some, some conversation. Uh, and, and one of the drivers for this session really is that we've been getting questions, um, given that the changes in, in the, the, the spikes in traffic and, and the overall volume uh, of, of internet traffic increasing, a lot of questions around how do we upgrade what we have today? How do we prepare for longer term? So what are some of those options that are available? So that's, that's really the, the, the plan here is to walk through some of those short term fixes and longer term uh, solutions. Yeah, no, that sounds good. So, you know, if we start with an existing system, uh, an existing link that's up and running, there's some things that could be done very quickly and easily without a site visit, just software, right? And some of these are pretty obvious. So they, um, the, the operators likely already thought of these, but it's it's worth, uh, you know, kind of capturing what these are. Uh, so the first thing is just making sure that the port uh, or isn't limiting the, the throughput. So there is some limitation around the, the bandwidth uh, capacity license, right? So you may be able to increase the license speed to allow more throughput, operate at higher modulation, for example. So that, that's a quick and easy one. Um, then you have uh, adaptive modulation. So a lot of links are designed at a fixed modulation. Maybe it's 256 QAM and you're getting a certain level of throughput at that modulation because you're comfortable with the availability. But with adaptive modulation, you can you can move up to a higher, you know, 2048 or 4096 QAM modulation um, and, and get much more throughput at a slightly reduced availability. So that, that gives you a lot more flexibility and can certainly prolong the life of that, that length in terms of the throughput. There, there's features out there like header and payload compression, uh, which which are just a software enabled feature which can can drive extra extra throughput. And then the, the, I guess the last option that, that can probably have the, the biggest impact here is moving to a wider channel. So if you had like an 11 gig, you know, for example, 11 gig, 40 megahertz channel, uh, you're, you're able to go up to 80 megahertz channels in FCC. So you could re-coordinate that uh, to to essentially double your throughput. So just to capture the, the pros of this this option are these are relatively low cost for a quick quick bump and throughput um, you know no site visit or hardware change required the the the, the, the trade off so that you know you have to you do have to modify your license though it's it's a relatively straightforward yeah. process and it's a shorter term solution in, in a lot of cases. What what so. No, that's great. That's, it sounds like there's at least two or three options to look at before before you go sink any more money in uh, a new link, new hardware. You know, these are a few things to touch on. What what type of 
expected extra capacity can they get from these options? So if they're if they're not using um, any type of compression now, I mean, what type of benefit, po possible benefit based upon you know average frame sizes? Sure. Yeah, on the compression side, uh, header compression. Uh, on its own, you, you might see five to ten percent uh, payload, depending on the, the frame size and the traffic mix. Um, or, or that that's the frame size and the, the traffic mix is more relevant to payload compression. So in that case, um, the, uh, the the traffic mix that you have as well. So with payload, you can see all the way up to you know we've seen 40, 50 percent gains of throughput. But more typically, especially with the very video intensive traffic mix, you're looking at the overall combination of header plus payload. It's probably in that 10 to 20% range uh, is what you'll see in terms of uh, compression gain. The nice thing with those features though is you can turn them on on a per queue basis. So if you don't want to touch your priority traffic, you leave those on on uncompressed queues and you can enable compression on the on the rest of your, your, your more compressible or lower priority traffic can be on those other queues. Yeah, no, I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of moving parts to it, but it's it's actually a pretty simple thing to enable, right? It's just a software key, typically, if, if the vendor supports it. Yeah, uh, dynamically enabling a feature, and, and all of a sudden your, your traffic is being compressed. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. Interesting. And then as far as the channel sizes, so if we're able to go and coordinate, let's say, from a 40 megahertz channel to an 80 megahertz channel, and the hardware can support that, I mean, that's 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 in theory it's it's twice the capacity right yeah it's, it ends up being a little less but it basically it's it's a doubling of throughput so in an 80 megahertz channel you could expect to see about 750 megabits per second at uh at let's say 4096 qualm at a higher modulation uh, but uh yeah. so that that would be significant bump oh huh. interesting all right well I, I think it's good to know that you know before you go explore anything else, it's it's good to make sure that you have all the, the dials turned on your existing system. So I think I think that's good data. Um, exactly. So exactly. We'll let you uh, transition to your next slide and uh, okay. go through that. You bet. Yeah. So the, the next option, which is uh, you know gives you more scalability, but it's a little more hands on because you have to send someone out to the site to do this, um, is is to move to a, a dual ODU or a two plus O configuration. Um, so you're, you're using a coupler to add a, a second radio, so you can see that in the, the bottom right here, uh, to your existing antenna. Um, so you, it allows you to double your throughput, maintain your same availability level that you had. Um, you, you're, you're using your same antenna. We also add redundancy. So if there is an outage, if one of the radios were to go down, you still have a fully active link at the backup. So it's a nice, uh, a nice option or a nice I guess, benefit of, of the 2 plus O configuration. Um, but it does limit your future scalability. So, I mean, once you've gone to 2 plus O, adding additional radios isn't practical. Um, you, know, you do have to license that second channel. And to get the coupler in place and add the second radio, there's a bit of downtime, but it's minimal because you're not swapping out or you're not realigning the antenna at that point. Yeah, great. So, I mean, it, it sounds like it's another example similar to if you can get twice the channel size. Now we're we're, we're taking a hardware option to add a second RF carrier to, to double the capacity. It's pretty good. Uh, but with, with two radios, are we going to have two cables going down? Is there any type of plumbing that we have to look at? Yeah, it's, it's a good point, good question. I mean, generally speaking, yes. I mean, most uh, in most cases, you'd be running a second cable down from the from the second radio, and then you've got you've got two data feeds. So. Uh, typically, you would then put that into a switch and use use something like lag to, to load balance across the two. Um, there are other configurations that that allow you to have a single data feed, but in most cases, yes, you would probably use a switch here. Yeah, I guess it depends on the radio vendor because some of them you could jump in between and then aggregate that traffic down. But probably from a day to day perspective, we're looking at two cables coming down. You have to think through how you're going to you know, route that traffic correctly. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, all right, good. Uh, another, uh, you know, good idea. Sure. Yeah, so we, we kind of take that as our, um, you know, updating your, upgrading your existing uh, length. So that, that those are the, the first two options. This is taking it to another level where you're actually swapping out to a different type of system. Uh, so in this case, you would have a dual carrier uh, ODU or outdoor unit in place of your single carrier radio. Uh, and what that does is it allows you to use a second channel. So it looks a lot like a single carrier radio, but actually have do, you know, 
two radios within that ODU. Um, and uh, this is something you'll see more, more commonly when you have a longer path that you can't, you know, you, you can't upgrade with something like a, a multi-band system, which we're going to talk about next. Um, so you, you want to maximize the throughput you can get in, in a traditional microwave type uh, solution. Um, so we can we can do that with the putting an ODU in place. We can also do like we did on the previous chart, add yet another ODU to that, add a second ODU to that antenna with the coupler, which then becomes a four plus X if you have four active channels at that point. Um, so that's a four X capacity gain over your, your base configuration. Uh, again, we're using antenna, uh, we're using you know some of the cabling. Uh, your your um, it's a it's a relatively straightforward upgrade. Um, but uh, you know you do have to replace your radio. So if you have a, a place or you have something to do or redeploy that that single carrier radio that's already up there, then great. But otherwise, it's, it becomes stranded capital. So I mean, it's it's ideal in a case where you can redeploy that that system. Yeah, if your if your network's growing and you could use that single carrier radio somewhere else to get capacity going, and then you have to beef this up, it's a it's a good use case. Exactly. And the only the other two points are with the. Um, uh, you know, four plus so if you're talking wide channels it's going to be challenging unless you're a very very remote location to get all of that spectrum so you may be spectrum limited particularly in, in 11 gig yeah on, on this option i think you have to definitely work with your fcc coordinator to understand what options as opposed to speculating you have to make sure you have the right channels you have the right the right polarity things like that Exactly. Exactly. It's 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 very much a you know a bit of planning and working with the coordinator to see what what makes the most sense. Um, yeah. As far as reusing the antenna, so you know, depending upon the client, I mean, they might have old single carrier radios out there doing two fifty six palm or something. Um, are there options for these dual carrier systems as far as like the the, the power? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, there that is something that we're seeing, particularly in dual carrier radios. Um, a move towards much higher power. So a lot of the, the more legacy radios out there, um, you know, might cap out at, you know, 20 dBm, something like that, right? The new systems are like 34, 35. So you're getting much, much more power in these these uh, outdoor radios and in the high power variants of these radios. So you can move up to higher modulations, yet maintain or even improve your availability. So it's it's a, you're right. I mean, it's more than just getting the additional throughput of the added channel. You're also getting higher modulation support, better availability with those existing antennas. So it's a kind of a, a double benefit. Yeah. We especially see it a lot in like the 11 gigahertz uh, band. That's where we see the biggest difference uh, in, in from a technology perspective. Is that, that is that accurate? Uh, absolutely. 11 gig. I mean, we've done projects where everything was spec'd in as a, with a six foot antenna. We were able to drop that to a, a three foot, even a two foot dish um, by going to a high power uh, system in 11 gig. So, uh, wow. Yeah. No, that's a, uh, you know, a little bit of, you know, a little bit of research that has to be done with the uh, FCC coordination, but the benefits sound, you know, pretty beneficial. I mean, being able to double capacity, maybe even increase modulation while double, doubling uh, the capacity, you know, definitely has, it sounds like it has benefits if, if it's planned correctly. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. All right, cool. What else you got? What are the tricks you right. have? <laughs> last, the last main uh, area we're going to talk about is around multi-band systems. Um, so, you know, E-band radio has been on for a while, but, but really used in isolation. And, and the perception was that very, very short lengths on our mild don't touch anything else. But I mean, that's really evolved in the last uh, year or two. Or two. Um, but we're seeing it much more focus on multi-band radio. So taking an existing 18 or 23 gig, and I say 18 or 23 because typically you know, uh, this, this is more applicable to the slightly shorter paths. Um, but you take that link and you add uh, an E-band in parallel, and they work together. So it's it's not they're not just two independent uh, links. You actually have load balancing between the two, and uh, there, there's there's awareness of like the E-band radio knows what's happening with microwave link and is able to uh, adapt according to conditions. So you have a single, in this case, you know, in the diagram we're showing, you have a single 10 gig interface coming out of the E-band system that's balancing across those two systems. Um, so, you know, it is a great option for 18 and 23 gig. Um, even even in some cases, 11 gig, if it's a lower rain rate region, um, you know, say under 
eight miles or so, you absolutely could look at de deploying them there. Um, it's, it's by far the highest capacity option uh, in terms of upgrading. There's no doubt downtime to your existing link or very little as you connect it to, to your EBAN system. Um, and, and again, the load balancing is, is really key here. Yeah, what, what things do you need to consider? So I, I think the, the different equipment vendors have different ways that they do multiband. Um, in, in the picture that you have here, it looks like they're basically daisy chained to each other. Is there anything that you need to be looking at from a standards perspective on the existing radio to make that work? Yeah, if uh, in particularly if you're talking about using this, because I mentioned, you know, they can be vendor agnostic in some cases, um, or, or they interrupt. So as long as that microwave link um, is under 1.6 milliseconds, which is pretty much every microwave link, um, and uh, supports, it can present flow control information. So the EBAN knows what the radio is doing in terms of if it's modulating down or doing something like that. Um, so flow control. Those are essentially the the main criteria and that'll allow you to then um, have that interoperability between the two systems and that load balance between the two systems oh uh, interesting interesting so you know it, it it looks like uh looks like a great idea but what you know we're talking about not longer than eight miles like where do we think like the sweet spot is for this from a from a link budget perspective where it's it's useful yeah, good question. And sort of tease up the next next chart because we want to present an example of what, you know, real world example of what this would look like. Um, you know, eight eight miles is definitely achievable. It just depends on what your expectation is in terms of availability. You know, maybe it's just ninety nine percent uptime for that length, which is still a lot better than, you know, what uh, you know all that extra capacity ninety nine percent of the time might sound pretty good in some cases. Uh, but but a, a, like I would say, a, a reasonable uh, link example here is a four mile path with an average rain rate in this case 33 millimeters per hour sort of an average in the US um, if we look at an eight, existing 18 gig with two foot antennas 80 megahertz channels and then we add an e-band to that with two foot antennas this table you know, just quickly summarize what that would look like so at your 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 five nines availability level you're still see, you're getting your, your microwave capacity full capacity 750 meg and you're adding 500 meg EBAN. It's, it's lower in this case because EBAN uh, would be modulated down in this scenario, right? To me, the, that modulate, that, that, that availability means it's operating at lower modulation. But you're still, you're still over 1.2 gig of throughput. And if we- yeah, so in, in that example, the microwave link might be working at, at optimal levels because it's designed that way. Exactly. Five nines. And then the, the underlying link is, the E band is going to drop modulation to give you the availability. So we're only getting 500 meg out of a 10 gig system, but it's 500 meg at five nines. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's more or less your worst case scenario, right? Um, yeah. And then as you, you you look at the lower availabilities, and like these are still, you know, um, if we go all the way to the bottom of the table, you know, two nines and a five, that's still. I mean, I think it's four hours of of downtime, you know, on the E band link per month. Um, so still a lot of uptime. And in this case, you're getting the full 10 gig throughput, right? So your E-band's operating at full capacity and your microwave's operating at full capacity. So you're using that 10 gig interface to its you know, full potential. And um, you know, this is on a four mile path. We can stretch that out. And there's there's a lot of tools and there's really good tools that allow us to model that and show the trade-offs between the two. Uh, but I think yeah, this is a good real world. Is, the rain rate is really what is going to dictate you know better or worse performance so this is just an example of an average rain rate region correct correct yeah absolutely this is average and it's uh you know in terms of link spamming I mean, we have a lot of a lot of customers with links in the in the five six seven you know and below mile range so it's applicable to a large number of the installed links that are out there today yeah so so to oversimplify it if if you have an 18 or 23 gig link today whatever vendor it is and it's in a three to five mile range and you, they they want to see some increased capacity quick the other benefit i guess is e band's a little bit easier to license from a time to license perspective and availability yeah good point for sure it's a it's a really uh self-registration process that's uh, very very quick and easy to get up and running um and, and, and very low cost and the systems themselves the e-band radios have really come down in price so the 10 gig system is is uh is a uh, very you know very cost effective option to get all that capacity yeah 
But I, I guess, you know, based upon the current environmental situation, it might be something that you underlay this EBAN link to deal with the current network congestion. But then you could take down that EBAN link and then use it somewhere else in your network after, because it's pretty, again, it's pretty easy to license. So it's, it's portable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a good point. Because you're not, you're, you're not really, uh, you're deploying a separate system, a separate antenna. So yeah, it is, is a lot more, uh, easier to redeploy than if you're integrating fully integrating into existing link yeah huh. no um so that that was you know we had a quick summary i mean there's there's several paths there's a bunch of key factors i won't get into each one of these but really it comes down to you can optimize or maximize what you have today you can add hardware to what you have today um to to, to boost throughput or use a different type of hardware in the case of, of a, a dual carrier system uh, uh, or you know, complement what you have today with it with a, a multi-band uh, solution. Um, so you know, the, the several key, key factors that will allow you to kind of make the, that decision. Uh, link distance and capacity requirements are a big a big part of it. And then you know, you're ultimately what was the cost per bit of the different different options available. So that, that more or less um, you know wraps up the, the the different scenarios, and you know, can definitely. Uh, dive in in any of these areas in more detail or you know, run path profiles. Um, so, uh, you know, here's a, you know, our contact information is here. If there's anything that we want to explore, uh, you know, be happy to do that with you. Great. Well, uh, I appreciate you going through all that information. I think, you know, lots of good options, especially options where, you know, finding more hardware. I think that's probably the first option. You know, adding adding new hardware, but making sure that you plan that correctly, and then potentially leveraging this uh, new uh, multiband. Uh, I think it definitely gives some, you know, good ideas to the, uh, you know, whoever's uh, listening in at from home. Uh, you know, again, we're we're trying to provide vendor agnostic, you know, guidelines to best practices, things that we're seeing. Hopefully, these are good ideas, and uh, you know, Chris, definitely appreciate you being here today, and. Uh, Absolutely. Any, any, any parting words for, for the team Future Tech Land? <laughs> no, it was fun, fun to be part of our first, uh, I guess, live or uh, you know, interview style podcast. This is good. Um, but uh, yeah, no, just, uh, you know, thinking of everybody, uh, stay safe and healthy and look forward to, uh, to the next one sometime soon. Yeah, it'll be good. Be good. Well, thanks for joining us and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll send this out. So uh, we definitely appreciate it. And uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out to Chris. And, uh, you know, everyone stay safe. Thanks, Pete.